I'd first of all, I, I'd like to say a special thanks to Fintan Phelan, from, um, who's head of financial, farm financial management in Chagask. Fintan gave me the push initially to put in a proposal into the department and because uh, I didn't think we would have any legs to, to run with it and uh, much to our surprise um, we did we did get through and uh, we were we were offered the funding for for this project and I'd also like to thank the department for taking the risk on us uh, on that and um, so right here we have our pot of gold um, in our logo um, uh, so we have actually funding to go ahead and do this job as best we can um, we were, we have, our logo basically says it all, that we believe that with fully functioning soil biology, you do have a pot of gold. And that basically, it's, um, this is, the, the, is, is what we're aiming and striving to do over the next five years. The title of the project was to give you an outline of the results we've had to date. I have to apologise on that. We'd expected some of our baseline data back before this conference, but that hasn't actually happened. So all I can do is instead, at very short notice, is to rejig the presentation and actually give you the reasons behind what we're doing. So basically, if you look at it here, we have myself, Dave Beecher, John McHugh and Alan Mooney. Basically, we're the coordinators. Uh, none of our farms are involved in any of this because we want to hands off uh, to begin with. And then we have 12 farmers um, uh, that are a mixture of um, uh, tillage and uh, dairy. We have a very, very good reason for that. We have a very serious concern that when the explosion happens over the GMO issue, uh, animal feeds, is it 200 million? Is it 300 million? Is it 400 million? Is it 500 million? Is it 600 million euros we're spending on buying in GMOs for animal feeds? Is it 700 million? I'll leave that question and answer with you. We will be found out as having GMOs as part of our, our dairy diets in due course. And we're here trying to address it in form. Also, too, there'll be a synergy between uh, the livestock side and the tillage side. There is a bit more of a dominance in the tillage side in the group, but the exchange between the two and the incredible similarities that exist in what we're actually trying to accomplish is more diversity uh, above soil to bring about more uh, healthy populations of bacteria and other micro microorganisms uh, beneath the soil. And then we have um, Robbie Byrne, who's a very, very experienced biological farm consultant here in Ireland. For a long time, had to plough a long, lo lonely furrow against a lot of odds, a lot of difficulties. And it's great to see at this stage, we're very privileged to have him on board because he's incisive, clear thinking, and uh, not afraid to ask, as you can see already, the hard questions as we look for answers. We have James McDonnell, who is, uh, was an organic specialist, so at least he had a, a hands-on experience of thinking outside the box, looking at things differently, not having a remedy out of a bag uh, uh, to hand, uh, and, and basically I think that has stood him in, in good stead to being well disposed towards having a good attitude towards biological farming. And uh, we now have the extra bonus that um, we, we have this financial management side contribution to it, because the bottom line is, if it's not going to be economic, it's not going to be doable. And lastly then, we're very, very lucky to have as an international consultant, Christine Jones, um, uh, who is the foremost expert uh, on carbon sequestration, particularly through liquid carbon pathways, which feed mycorrhizal bacteria, or mycorrhizal fungi, which then subsequently head on and start scavenging, collecting and exchanging on, an, on, on a complete uh, exchange basis, uh, um, uh, trace elements, phosphorus, and other nutrients in exchange for pure energy in the form of carbohydrates from the, um, the plants uh, that um, have an association with them. So fundamentally, Danu is about, we believe the wheels are falling off the conventional NPK system. Uh, we certainly think that's the case in tillage. Um, we may have uh, what's considered relative to other countries, half decent uh, organic level, matter levels uh, in, in our soil, in our tillage soil stills, but we're, we're seeing issues um, now that we're looking at them with an open mindset, uh, 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 with a little more freedom to think differently, think outside the box and examine them ex for exactly what we're, what, 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 what we're actually looking at. Um, see what you look at, if you like. And uh, we've come, come, you know, in this group, we've come to the inclusion. We have to stop what we're doing. We have to change our way of going about it. And we have to do it ourselves because we're running out of time and we can't wait for somebody else to do it for us. 
And that's hopefully uh, what we, we, we will hope in this group, that um, we have no association other than the three people I mentioned to you outside with any other institutions on a formal basis. So we're either going to sweep and sink or swim on our own merit. And uh, uh, if we fail, we've only ourselves to blame. We're not tied up with any other organization's agenda. And that's, I'm not saying that in a critical way, but it's our agenda that's, that's at stake for, the, for, for what I'm going to outline out here. It's a farmer's agenda for farmers to try and resolve issues for farmers. And uh, we intend to cooperate and work very, very closely with Chagask, um, particularly Johnstown Castle. And the first thing, bit of advice that Fiona had said earlier yesterday, get a spade uh, would be the cheapest thing to do. And I know that John uh, is working away on getting the Tams grant sorted for spades. So that's a big help. Um, but the, 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 the thing is that the department have, because uh, uh, it is an innovation project, and I think that this is a bottoms-up uh, approach, and we need it because we're, we, we need to get to it fairly fast. And you can see the principles that, that are just outlined there as to what we're about. Um, and the focus of the project for the farmers is to learn and implement the basic principles of biological farming. And that will contain, or entail, if you like, reading, but most importantly, studying, uh, as well as reading. It's, uh, we have an obligation to become self-empowered um, if the information is not available there at a phone call, we have to find it out for ourselves. And part of our remit in this is as we start gathering data together, we will be publishing it on the, uh, through social media websites and that. That's an obligation we have. So there will be a feed out from what we're doing on an ongoing basis once we get past the setting up an initial baseline data. So I'm going to keep cracking on. There's a lot of stuff here. I may have to be cut off halfway through it, but um, hopefully I'll get to the bones of, of, of what we're about. And again, the point about having clear, workable guidelines in relation to uh, soil structure, chemistry, biology, and plant nutrition. Um, and I, uh, we, we, people sometimes say, well, farmers, you know, that's an awful lot to ask farmers to do. Look what farmers do already. Look at the level of precision and expertise that farmers have. Take a typical dairy farmer with the whole notion of, of controlled grass management. Um, diets, feeding, etc., etc. The level of knowledge is phenomenal, and I think it's at our peril we underestimate ourselves, our own capabilities. The hardest part is to start something, and you know the hardest part is to break an existing mindset, to assume that all is okay, and that we'll just carry on and everything will be fine. It's uh, the fact is that um, you know once you make the first moves, once you make the first attempt, it gets easier uh, as it goes along. Because there's no doubt about it, there's a formidable amount of information needed to be unlearned before we can relearn, if you like, what's actually going on in relation to biological farming. And I think that's a, a point that we will see uh, over time among, among the group, that, and already we've, we can see a dramatic shift in, co in, in confidence, in a consciousness about what we're actually trying to do. And I think Joel touched on it. It's not just about um, the farming in splendid isolation. It's about the bigger picture in the, the social, uh, economic, and the wider sphere of where we live as well. The point about the, um, the transition programs, they have to be uh, practical, affordable, and capable of implementation by any interested farmer. And we've designed the trials on that basis, and I'll come to that now in a second, but fundamentally, we're about carbon farming, or learning about carbon farming, getting to grips with carbon farming as a reality. And uh, there was a comment there about everything is going pretty well in Irish soils. I'd like to go through this. Um, I'll go through it in detail, because I think it's reflective of what we're seeing on the ground. And, uh, this is a summary of 3,000 comprehensive soil tests that are taken in between 2015-2016. Uh, Approximately 50% tillage, 50% um, grassland. Um, the company that was doing these samples had asked me not to have the individual named, he just didn't want it publicised. But I am fairly comfortable that these are, uh, the, these are figures that can be stood over. They're simply um, averages and summaries of, of what's actually been seen. Um, Exchange capacities, which is the, the, the holding tank, or, or the, the ability of the soil to hold nutrients, is uh, between 7 and 14 uh, of an exchange capacity. And uh, that's pretty decent. The lower, 7 would be lower towards more a sandy-type loam. 
um, and 14 would be towards a, a, a loam. And then further up to 25, you're looking, up, up looking at more, which is a larger holding tank you're looking at. And there's not, not many soils in the country up at that level, but you're talking about much, uh, soils with much more higher clay levels. 70% um, of tests had good to high levels of calcium-based saturation. Now that's more than likely, that's not reflective of the national average. The reason for that is very likely is that a lot of these farmers are ahead of the curve. They're actually going to get comprehensive tests taken because they're looking at going into transition to a different, different uh, 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 method of farming or approach to farming. And um, I think, you know, and, and that is definitely in contrast to the national trend. Uh, three to seven percent magnesium based saturation. And that is below optimum. We have only got a couple of areas in Wexford um, and I think in parts of Wicklow where we do have high magnesium uh, soils. Magnesium, when it's in excess beyond what would be considered the ideal ratio in base saturation, makes soil sticky. Uh, it, it has other complications with it as well. Um, but for the most part, um, most of our actual um, base saturation levels of magnesium are below par. Um, but interestingly enough, we find in the Morgan's test that um, we actually have, uh, for the most part, actually a lot of soluble magnesium available. But then when it comes to actually getting into the plant, we really have problems in getting sufficient magnesium into plants. And uh, there's a number of reasons for that, too detailed to go into here, but it has to do with the balancing and the interaction and the ratios between a number of other key elements that are, in, that are involved in um, plant nutrition. Um, available potassium levels are low and it ha they have been declining, similar to national trends. Um, that's, uh, we won't go too much onto, onto potassium. There's a lot of issues with that as well. Um, sulfur, sulfur is the key in the ignition. And if sulfur levels are not at a, an optimum level, you really are starting off at a very, very poor uh, setup, if you like. It's the key to, that, that, that it's a, a surface activator. It's very, very necessary for producing quality protein. It's particularly important for uh, detritus and uh, residue breakdown. Uh, it's important that the, uh, uh, particularly if, if you're looking at um, the, the bacterial element uh, and not just the fungal element of, of breakdown that you have sufficient sulfur available for, for them to do it. But it's 80% um, uh, below optimum levels is significant. And 80% at low phosphorus levels, although uh, we're very fortunate uh, as a country that we actually have very, very high reserves of phosphorus in our soils. Very, very high reserves. Most of them are locked up. They can only be accessed uh, over a long period of, or over a long period of time, or the access to that phosphorus can be accelerated with robust, vibrant uh, biological activity, and that's, if you like, what we would be looking at. We know that we're very fortunate, given that world reserves of phosphorus are considered to be very finite—30 um, years, maybe 40 years at current rates of usage. Um, phosphorus recycles quite a bit. As, as part of the whole energy transfer process. There are offtakes of phosphorus we have to account for as well. Um, but with those reserves there, it's accessing those reserves. It's accessing these reserves. Sorry, that, um, pardon, I'm just not used to this. Uh, it's accessing these reserves here that are, are, are quite important. 99% of soils less than one part per million boron. If you haven't got boron at the optimum levels, your calcium levels are just not going to happen. Boron is absolutely critical in the, in the, in the, in the, in the transport system. And boron is considered to be the steering wheel, and calcium is the truck. And we'll come along to the, a, a very, very important nutrient that we never discuss, but that is now beginning to be appreciated worldwide as an essential nutrient to look at in the bigger scheme of things. Um, nine, uh, nine, so the boron at, at those levels doesn't suggest that our utilize uh, that 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 we are, if you like, in a, in an optimum situation with it. Ninety five, ninety percent of soils uh, iron levels above two hundred parts per million, and we're seeing th that there's been a trend for an increase of of soluble iron. That's a compaction issue. There's a lot more compaction, and particularly Fiona mentioned it, compaction below the topsoil layer that's actually taking place and uh, it, needs to, it needs to be accounted for. Once you're at those kind of levels or, or above, uh, you know, 200 parts per million is, is, it's really, you wouldn't like it much more than that ideally because there's a, a very important ratio between iron and manganese and ideally you want uh, the iron at uh, two parts of iron and one part manganese. 
and uh, we're seeing soils uh, 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 samples up to uh, 400 parts per million. Um, now, there's a tendency in Irish soils to have high iron uh, by the particular nature of our soils, um, but definitely um, these, there's a trend towards higher levels, and uh, that is a management issue that needs to be addressed. Um, the manganese, we're very lucky, we have very good manganese levels. Um, in England, in a lot of soils, they would be using a lot of uh, manganese supplements uh, because they don't have as good a levels as we have here. The one figure I was surprised at, I had expected the copper levels to be lower than they are. Or in other words, I, there was only 30% of soils below an optimum level. And I would agree with Gary, I think that figure of three parts per million is the borderline, if you like. It's, it's, uh, I, the preference would be to have it closer towards five parts per million. 80% had inadequate zinc. If you don't have a, 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 a sufficient zinc levels, and there's a 10 to 1 ratio between phosphorus and zinc that's essential for phosphorus movement through the, through the, the root system into the plant, you are in trouble. And uh, these zinc levels are very, very low. One of the reasons when your cows are out and they get a chance to break away from the, from the enclosed grazing systems and they go for the ivy, they love ivy because it has zinc in it, uh, lots of zinc in it, uh, in an available form. And 70% uh, had, had molybdenum levels above 0.7 parts per million. The issue is raised about molybdenum being awkward. But we can't do without molybdenum if we're talking about biological farming. Molybdenum is essential for um, rhizobium fi fixation. Um, it's, it, it sits in, in a very, very complex enzyme right down in the center of it. That, that, and uh, it, 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 its particular makeup facilitates the breaking of, of, the, of the, the triple bond on nitrogen. It's also extremely important in, in, uh, in, in, in um, moving uh, nitrates within the, the leaf of the plant to ammonia and to amides and then setting it up for um, amino acid formation. So molybdenum is a very, very important element. The problem with, with copper um, can, is something that can be addressed in a number of different ways. It's not really for me to go into it right now, but um, in, the di like in the diet itself, you, you would probably address any potential surface molybdenum by copper sulfate uh, an amount, and then uh, chelated, copper, chelated copper then, uh, which would be bypassed in the room and to ensure that the animal has an adequate supply entering the, the bloodstream. Um, we have 100%, 100% of cobalt levels below 0.5 parts per million. Cobalt is essential for rhizobia and azotobacter and all other free living um, uh, nitrogen fix fixers. It's also essential for protozoa and, um, uh, because uh, as an animal, right, it needs um, uh, to make vitamin B12. And we can see here that if this is the case across these samples here, now maybe they were coming from a particular part of the country. They weren't. They were coming from all over the country. If this is the case, and we're, I, we're, we're, I think we're going to see similar uh, uh, results when, when we get the results back from Danu. Um, um, the whole point is that we have, we have to look at this. And if we don't actually uh, look for it, we're not going to know anything about it. Um, now, the, I, well, we'll, we'll move on, and i just give you an idea. This is... This is uh, 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 a, a slide showing the decline in um, between 1940 and 1991 of a select number of minerals in, in vegetables and in fruit. And um, Linus Pauling, um, I think this statement is absolutely accurate. I think more and more people are coming around to the reality of it. Um, the, um, Dan has touched on it very, 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 very succinctly on a number of occasions, both yesterday and today. If it's true, and it appears to be, that 95% of all terrestrial species live in soil, only 5% of species live above soil. And if it is a, a healthy soil is considered to be the second most diverse ecosystem after a healthy coral reef. We're in trouble with the healthy coral reefs as it is. We don't have that many left. Coral reefs have been, as an ecosystem, they've been severely damaged as a consequence of man's um, activities. But I want you to think about this. I want you to think about this uh, as a concept, if you like, that we have in the top six inches of soil the second most diverse ecosystem on the planet. And if we look 
the question we would ask with all these trophic or feeding levels and circulating systems that are moving around here between uh, the, the photosynthesizers, because the, 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 the true source of all energies in these systems is, is photosynthesis, and not just from direct sunlight, but at infrared levels as well. There are a number of bacteria groups, phototropes can live a number of inches below the soil, sometimes down to a foot below the soil, who actually photosynthesize using um, infrared uh, radiation um, as part of the light spectrum. And they're, they're a very, very important part of the overall soil biology. Um, there's so much and so wide a diverse biology that it's very, very hard to talk about them all in one occasion. But here's the question. How many elements or nutrients are needed for the efficient fun function of a healthy food web? The question basically is, how many energetic activities do you think are going on in this massively diverse ecosystem? How many metabolic pathways are actually taking place? It's not going to take a huge leap of faith to appreciate. They must be vast. And definitely, if they're vast, we need much more nutrients than we're given to believe to date to ensure that all, the, all these uh, metabolic pathways actually can be in effect. And this is in Danu, this is part of our thinking, is to understand this. Now, some of these nutrients are needed in very, very small amounts. They're not needed in big amounts at all. But if they're missing, it's a limitation. And that's the key question. If we're going to be able to move away from an NPK system, we have to do and we have to work at understanding, well, exactly what are we moving towards and how do we do it in a most effective manner? And that enta entails a certain degree of measurement and appreciation of what's going on. Now, the expectation for, for any farmer to go and have all the elements tested it, it would be ridiculous. There are a number of ways of short-circuiting it that are already in place. And this is the interesting thing. Um, I just want to put this up because there is a kind of a, an idea that we're having a wonderful explosion in understanding soil biology of late. The reality is some of the most formative and uh, 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 interesting work that was done on soil biology happened in the 30s, 40s and 50s. And uh, this guy, Krasrilnikov, in 1958 published a seminal work. It's available on the internet. I would advise anybody interested in biological farming to download it, translated into English in 1961, and just read what he's written here. It's about five, six hundred pages of a total understanding of the fact that uh, the metabolites, vitamin C, vitamin B, all the, all the metabolites that are needed, that the plant and the whole, eco, the whole uh, uh, biological system under the soil have a complete synergistic relationship taking place. And that um, the one way to kill it all off or to, to dampen it all down uh, or to, from the point of view of that synergetic, uh, synergy, if you like, or <laughs> beneficial relationship is to distort the environment, particularly with soluble salts. And I'm not against artificial nitrogen. I'm not against artificial uh, pot uh, potash or phosphorus or any other of the elements. Um, it's the way they're used is the problem, and they should be used. And I think a core principle in biological farming is never put any fertilizer amendment on the soil that's going to interfere or dampen down the soil biology. And I think if that rule is used as a, a, a first principle, uh, it, it makes it easier then from that first principle to develop sets of, of behaviours and practices that would lend itself over time to us getting to grips with this new way of farming and uh, thinking about how we should manage our soils. Um, so with, with that in mind, given what I've shown you as what I wouldn't consider to be <coughs> balanced soils from a trace element point of view from what I showed you earlier, I just don't believe that 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 is the case. And um, let's have a look at, at, at what we've actually intended to set up to do. On the control plot, we have to have a control plot on these farms. We made a decision that we would um, follow the, the, the standard uh, Chagas guidelines and recommendations or over the five years of the plan. Um, now, I have to emphasize this right now. I did earlier that this is a farmer's project. We have had written into the proposal that the department accepted. And the department gave us the go-ahead on 
uh, to this project on the basis that we made it clear from the off that we were not going to be running any trials or programs with the level of scientific rigor that a, an academic research institution could have. There's an absolute necess necessity for scientific rigor when you're actually doing something that is going to be published as a paper and it will be peer-reviewed and that is an important contribution to a particular aspect of any uh, uh, subject. But we're farmers. Farmers. And we're just trying to figure things out as farmers. But, with, but being farmers that are trying to empower ourselves and to bring a level of knowledge uh, uh, by through our own efforts and in consultation with people who are more expert than us. And there, we, 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 we freely concede there are so many things we don't know. There's so many things in the literature, in the textbooks that are now available and on the internet that are about biological farming. There's a lot of contradictory statements being made. Uh, one of our uh, jobs in this will be to try and put together uh, uh, what we already have a, a, a reading list, but more importantly, as we see, uh, um, if you like, statements or, or uh, um, ways of, of doing things that we can see are completely out of kilter, we will inform people through the, whatever social media and that, that we will be using to disseminate the, the results from this project. But we have to have a control, and we're going to follow the standard program for the control. Now, one or two of the farmers, which is funny really, says, I don't know how I'm going to manage that three or four years into this project and to see my lonely Hector if it's going in a particular direction and everything else is moving in another direction. But that's part of the sacrifice that the 12 farmers have made. I call them the 12, deposit, uh, 12 disciples with the hope at the end of this in five years' time that they will truly become 12 apostles to spread the word a lot further, that they will have gone through this whole period of training and, and, and understanding and that they will be an inspiration for other farmers, for the rest of us in the farming community to take control of what we need to do ourselves because the only people truly interested in, in our well-being is, our, is ourselves. And that's not to be critical or, or overly um, unkind to uh, people outside of farm families. But the reality is we're being squeezed every way, which way and center. And Robbie Bourne put his finger on it very, very well. When we get clamped, and because John had emphasized very, very clearly how inept and how lackadaisical and how lack of effort we've been making in relation to our, our national approach to uh, greenhouse gases, etc., etc., And the chickens are going to come home to roost. We're going to be told what to do. And then the government, and it, and it will have, uh, out of necessity, have to tell the farmers, you will do that and you won't do that. And that's, and that's going to be the end of it. That's simple politics. Yeah, I'm not here to discuss that, but that's the reality of it. So the second plot, because we have to think as well, what can be done on a national level that an interested farmer could do without worrying? Cheapers, I couldn't afford to do that. There's too many things there to be doing. The first thing to do is to make sure no nitrogen goes out without a carbon source. <coughs> and also potassium should, or potash should go out with uh, uh, particularly acid, acid, acid ph phosphorus, which any of the combinations on the 18612, 0, uh, 0730, any, any of the combination soluble fertilizers, all the, the phosphorus in that is an acid phosphate. And the fact is that when it hits the soil, only a very small portion of it is used by the plant, maybe 10, 15% at best, and over the next two months, it's, it's actually, if the soil is very acid, it'll form a, an iron phosphate complex, or if it's a, 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 at, a, at a, a good pH of 6.5 or higher, it'll form a calcium phosphate complex and becomes unavailable to uh, the plant. Um, unless there is uh, exceptionally robust uh, functioning soil biology. So, but if you put a carbon source out with it, you are actually dampening it and you are basically uh, binding it and not having a flood there and not having the other scavengers, the other, other nutrient minerals scavenging that want to share between a positive ion and a negative ion that actually want to, to unite up together. Because the plant, you know, 
one of the problems in the NPK system, it's like uh, giving a baby uh, what it needs uh, for a month. Do you know, after two days, the milk is definitely going to be sour. After a couple of weeks, it's going to be really sour. And what you're trying to do here in principle is to um, uh, uh, bind it up or buffer it out so that it's not actually causing such a disruption in the... Because the, remember, if, if, if you have a, a salt fertilizer, it's in solution. It's like putting salt into a glass there, in the soil water solution. The water roots have no choice but to take up the water with the salt in it. They don't have a choice. They can't. It's like being on a, on a boat out at sea and the only water you can drink is seawater until there's enough rainfall or until, until there's enough dilution as a consequence of leaching and drainage, etc. And if the plant is taking up more than it really wants, it brings about imbalances elsewhere. The plant's signal, uh, its signature starts to change. It's sending out messages. There's something not right here and the disease situation comes in. That's the classic NPK system because if where there's a disease, we have the answer to that too. The plant is sick, we'll give you the cure. A pesticide, a fungicide, a this, that, and the other. It's a very simple cycle, but it's a cycle that um, we can't escape. This is the reality of it. The second or the third plot then will be full mineral balancing over the period of the trial. And we will be using strategic use of foliars in this situation. Now, I wanted to go back because I, it's an important point. The end, we were thinking about it, um, should it be ground application or foliar? Now, if it's ground application, we don't have to, and we're trying to think of what, what, what can a farmer do without doing anything else and at least cost. If we put it on as a ground application and have a binder with it, uh, sucrose, molasses, uh, molasses humates, uh, or other carbon source slurry, uh, compost, um, that may sound strange, but uh, it has to do with carbon-nitrogen ratios, um, will we, um, if we put it on as a foliar, say like urea as a foliar, and we were thinking about that and we had to sort of change our minds fairly quickly, but if we put it on as a foliar, the plant is going to have to take it in and has it enough trace elements in the soil that's, not, that's in an NPK system going out of an NPK system. And we decided maybe it not, might not be a good idea to put it on on this second plot as a foliar. Do you see the way we're thinking? Because, you know, if we put it on as a foliar, we're not giving the, ch the plant the chance or the opportunity to say, OK, I'll start pulling in the other trace elements I need now to go ahead and make protein with this, uh, because the trace elements may not be available there. So the only way we could justify putting it on as a foliar is to add the trace elements to it. If we start adding the trace elements to it as a foliar, we're now in a situation, well, who's going to do this nationally if they're only going to do one thing to at least make a start? So these are the things we didn't know at the start. These are the things, uh, this is typical of what we were going to have to find out as we uh, move through it. And as we find out, you'll find out. Because this is what we intend to do is to relate it. Because we don't have the answers. We're not really sure about what will work or what won't work. That's why we have the project. And the lastly then, um, uh, uh, the foliars, one of the key things we're looking for, uh, 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 for, for livestock side, we can't ask a dairy farmer or, or somebody at, a, at an intensive stocking rate who wants to consider going biological farming. One of the things that's important is the soil temperature in the spring, um, bi biological activity in the soil. And if we're in a biological system, it's that soil biological activity that is starting to get the, the ball rolling and to get the, the exodus are beginning trickling down at low temperatures to the soil or to, to the microorganisms. And in response then, they're, they're metabolizing and they release, release uh, um, nutrients in, in, in a very usable fashion for, for the plants, in a very efficient fashion for the plants. But can we ask the dairy farmer who sees all his friends out uh, on the 5th of February, say, grazing away, and he has to hold back a little bit because the inclination is the soil temperature is not up enough. If I'm going to do this, that, and the other, I have a lag period actually taking place. Well, the only way you can ask a farmer to do that and be confident in doing it without him thinking he's going to lose his, lose his shirt is if he has highly mineralized silage. The difference between regular silage and a highly mineralized forage is phenomenal. Ask Gary Zimmer. 
That's what he's all about. So that strategic 10 days that you didn't go out and maybe a strategic shift in calving pattern as well because the, we have a vet on board for very good reason. We want to see animal behavior. And just on that subject is the fact that a cow in its natural condition will live to 15, 16 years of age. Cows normally die in those conditions because they lose their teeth. What's the average number of lactations in Irish dairy herds in the last 30 years? Has it gone up? Average number of lactations per cow? Has it gone up? It's gone down. I'll leave it at that. Okay, so the last one then is full mineral balancing plus selected inoculants over the period of the trial. And this is basically we're looking at adding on um, possibly uh, seed treatments with mycorrhiza, trichoderma, fungi, um, adding on um, along with uh, seaweeds and, and other mixtures. We're going to be like little chemists out on the farm in a lot of ways, um, tricking with it a little, but with intelligence, with uh, approach and with attitude and with the development of an understanding of what we're actually trying to accomplish. Because um, there's a lot of uh, talk about inoculants being able to solve everything uh, very quickly. Well, I don't believe that. Um, I believe some can be useful and I think in many situations it can be hit and miss. I think the biology is already in the soil. It may be dormant, it may be quiet, it may be uh, waiting for its opportunity to have an environment uh, kind of conducive to it expressing its full potential to be provided for it. And part of the provision of that is making sure that the nutrient range uh, uh, is actually available to uh, the plant. And secondly, the agronomy and husbandry and the way we're actually managing those soils. And, you know, think about, and I, I'm more on the grassland side, that's been my, my, my thing. I, I, I'd be the first to freely admit that I'm not an agronomist, I'm not a soil scientist. Um, but the, if you think in simple terms about compaction, let's say you have big bale, big bale silage, you know, it's not in the, the, the super duper forage harvester situation going in a couple of hours, fields are clean, this, that and the other, and it rains the day after it's baled. Well, think about the amount of compaction drawing those bales in and out. In, out, in, out, in, out. Like the idea that we don't have compaction in our soils. Oxygen is actually the most, uh, is the nutrient that we're most short of in Irish soils. Oxygen. Um, I believe, and uh, Robbie believes, and um, anyway. Each trial plot is going to be a minimum of one hectare and uh, a maximum of two. And uh, this is just the four trial plots here. Um, we would have uh, the trial that would be the control, we would have it to the, um, is it the leeward side of the wind? If the prevailing wind is coming this way, we would, we, we would, we would use that trot as, uh, to ensure, to minimize the risk of, of any drift uh, from fungicides or whatever back into the other trials. There's going to be a certain amount of uh, things that we run into that won't be uh, uh, picture perfect, but that's the point I was making, and that's the point in which we got the proposal was there was no expectation on us to work within the, the, the rules of scientific rigor. We can think on our feet. In the same way, if we find a program that's not working, we'll stop it on year three, stop it on year two, and we move to something else. The reason we do that is that's exactly what a farmer would do. The only one that we will uh, retain the whole way through will be the control. <coughs> the only exception on the control will be, uh, in the livestock situations, will be allowing treated slurry on the control. Because we're not prepared to put any farmer through the obligation and the cost of holding a slurry tank back that's not treated. Uh, simply because there's so many tanks in the country not treated um, for the five years of the project. That's an economic loss to them and because we, we are very, very serious about actually trying to do more with slurry because slurry is a fantastic product if it can be done right. And the real test of whether we've got slurry right to, to move off the point a little bit is we don't want any earthworms turning up dead on top of the ground after slurry goes out. If we can get that sorted, we're halfway there. Uh, because basically what it's, what it's insisting upon when that happens is the material is abrasive. It's, it, it, it's a harsh material in, in that particular form. The earthworms are coming up because they're interested in nutrients and the environment then they find that it's, the signals that they thought were right are just, uh, it's not as right as they thought it was. And as you know, grey crows and all the rest of it. But we're, we're, we may be ambitious, but we're hopefully, hopefully towards the end of the five years, we hope we'll have a resolution to that to some extent. We're in, we intend for each of the, and this is all available to all of you, um, why these things are not published is beyond me. 
why so few people know about this absolutely brilliant work that exists uh, uh, within uh, the organisations is beyond me. Um, this is from the Soil, Irish Soils Information System that Chagas are uh, very, uh, very closely involved with, with Cranfield as well, uh, as well. I can't remember the third as well. It's all available online. It's tricky. It's tricky to use at the start. Um, but basically, you can, you can find your farm if you know your coordinates. You'll recognise it anyway from a Google map or your area aid map. Find your farm, click in the soil series that it actually has. Because it's essential that all four plots in each farm are from the same soil series. We don't want to be crossing over into two soil series because that's going to skew the results. Now, if uh, there may be one farm where uh, it might be a bit tricky for that relative to the plot we'll be using, but if that's the case, we'll account for it. We'll have it, we'll have it recorded that that is the case. Um, but this is all available um, online, and it's a matter of, you've got the soil, and then you've got the, the details of the soil association, and then you've got the details of the um, uh, association composition. And then there's further details here, uh, which actually give you, and I just uh, um, so gives you the, the, the sand particle size distribution, and that determines the soil texture. Funny enough, on some of them, you'll actually find the total elements in the soil uh, with, with maybe 25, 30 different elements. Not on all of them, on some of them, levels of arsenic, nickel, etc., etc., gold, silver, and uh, fascinating reading if you've nothing better to do. Um, and it's for free. But it's, um, it's at least lets you know it starts, it's another piece of information added to, to the beginnings of, your, uh, of the, the movement in this direction is to start getting your ducks in order, you know. Well, actually, what soil series am I in? Because we've been, it's been made clear to us we're going to see, or the likelihood is we're going to see, soil type, particle size, distribution and aggregation is going to have an effect on the type of biology we're going to get. I told you I'd be out of time. Yeah. Sorry about this, guys. I, 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 I have an awful lot of stuff here, but if I, uh, um, we started a bit late, I, 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 I just have to cut it off when, when he cuts me off. Um, this is the standard, standard Irish soil test, and this is the advanced Irish soil test. That's the way Southern Scientific described the test, and that's pretty much. For what we're doing, it's, and I want to make this clear, these are seriously accurate soil tests. <laughs> You know, at, at the same time, in the same breath or on the same hand, uh, they're a snapshot of what's actually going on the day because what they're measuring is what's in solution. That's actually available in solution, in the soil solution to the plant on the day, on the hour that that uh, soil sample was taken. <coughs> this is the soil sample we're going for. And we're taking a completely different approach. We, we need to because we need this baseline data. And I'll start off, and if I, if I have to finish on this, James, I'll finish on this. Um, but the gist of it is that um, we're, what we're first going to do is we're going on, on, the, on, the, on the, the, the preliminary test, or the, first, uh, the baseline data, pH, lime requirement, organic matter, percent to start, uh, and the estimated nitrogen release from organic matter. This is a, mathematically, it's a calculated figure, but it gives you some bearing as to what is the potential for mineralization of nitrogen during the crop growing period that actually can be made available to the plant and subsequently then it means that there, there can be more uh, judicious uh, additions of nitrogen uh, during the various growth, growth stages of the plant or rotations or whatever. And uh, we intend then to get the dry bulk density because what we found is a lot of our soils are actually of a lighter bulk density than what we're seeing in a lot of the biological farm and textbooks because they're, they're, they're a lot less clay in them. And if you have a bulk density of 1.3 meters cubed, or meters, uh, 1.3 tons per meters cubed, versus a, a bulk density of one ton per meter cubed, if you start working out on parts per million, the amount of trace elements that actually actually need or you want to address, you're talking about a 30% difference in density. You should account for it, especially if you need cobalt. And do you think we need cobalt? I think we need some cobalt. Cobalt at the moment is around 420 euros for a 20 kg bag of cobalt sulfate, which gives you 34% of elemental cobalt. And that's not the end of the story though. But as we go through this, and maybe this is a good way to finish, um, because I could be here for another two hours. Uh, 
with, with, with the other things we intended to do. So what we're, going, what we're measuring, so these are just characteristics that we're looking for here uh, in the dry bulk density, the sand, silt and clay. And I mentioned earlier, we would have some idea uh, from that soil series in that area, what it's likely to be. Um, but for this project, we would have to look for something a little bit more. Because remember, we have to think beyond ourselves for this. We're not doing it just for the farm. We don't, our expectation, wouldn't be that a farmer subsequently would have to go through this level of detail. What we're actually trying to do is to find out and tailor, to tailor the tests to suit the pocket and have a range of tests. And we're working very close with the laboratory try, to try and put this together. I think they don't know what happened when we went down to them. Um, they, they were really, really surprised that we wanted this and they were sort of laughing, uh, and in a good way, not in a bad way, about uh, nickel. And uh, we just made the point to them. You can't have a breakdown of urea into ammonium without, without, without ureas. And a limiting feature of urea is, is nickel, because nickel is an essential en enzyme for it. And when you have loads of glyphosate going out, you're not going to have nickel available to the extent you might have thought it had. Because glyphosate ties it up. That's why nickel, how nickel was actually found to be an essential element in plant nutrition as well, through GMO. Um, uh, soya and uh, maize rotations. And I think that was in Illinois or Michigan, I can't remember, but it was about 20 years ago uh, the penny dropped with them that that was the case. So we're looking first at the soluble elements and we're measuring at, uh, and, uh, and the extra ones we're adding are, we want to see at this time of the year in the autumn as a residual or as a background, the nitrate nitrogen and ammonium nitrogen, um, just to see what levels they're at. Um, we would Normally, we would like these to be reasonably equal, um, but if there is ammonium fertilizer going out uh, and it's still in the system, this is going to be changed, but a balance. Uh, and if there's a little excess of this relative to this, it can be indicative. And you have to be very careful about saying this now because it's, it, you know, it, it changes, like, it's like a leaf in the wind, um, but it can be indicative that biology is moving. But uh, I would never take a single reading or a single result on its own. It's another big lesson we learned. It's about, and the other thing as well, that we're not, we're not actually going to be treating the soil test. We're going to be treating the plot or treating the land. The soil test is a big help to get you focused and get you thinking, but it's not, it's not, it's not, the, it's not the absolute, um, absolute determination of, of exactly what's going on in the soil, because it's such a tiny sample of the soil to begin with. Then we're going to be looking at the available elements, and I put this in, 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 in red here, soluble, immediately available in solution for, for the plants, those, 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 those three, four elements, potassium, phosphorus, uh, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, and calcium. We've added magnesium and calcium, especially calcium. You can have a high pH soil, and um, you can have um, the, the, the level of available or, uh, uh, in, uh, soluble calcium may, may be actually lower than you would have thought it was. And if there's more, you know, there's an issue with biological activity as well. It makes, and particularly fungal, uh, uh, mycorrhizal activity, you can have uh, more available calcium uh, uh, at a given point in time in a, in a, in a less, uh, in, a, in a more, in, a, in an acidic soil, not a, a, a seriously acidic soil than you might have in, in a soil that is at the optimum pH after a lime application. But if it's out in a situation where the soil biology is not functioning correctly, um, it mightn't be the result you think. And calcium is the king. Key, key nutrient. It's not nitrogen. Calcium is the key nutrient. Calcium is the trucker. Because if calcium has got right, all the other elements behind it are going to come in, uh, are, are very much set up to come in behind it at an optimum level. And just on this as well, magnesium is always a problem getting it from the soil into the plant. And particularly, there's an antagonism between these two. Because magnesium has a tendency, because it's less mobile, believe it or not, it has a tendency, to, or it, 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 it is generally taken in through the feeder roots, the fine feeder roots of the plant, whereas potassium is taken in through the water roots. It has a propensity to move in that direction to the water roots. So very quickly, if there's a potassium loading, which we usually have when we're loading out on slurries and that, you get uh, potassium taken up much quicker than magnesium. And uh, that leads to problems uh, further on and where you have grass tetany and issues like that. And we have to look at these things very, very closely, very, very carefully, because we need answers to these questions as farmers. That's, that's our thinking. Um, the available nutrients then, um, these are the nutrients both in solution and on the clay humus colloids. The, the, the absorption sites on the, on the clay humus colloids and in the biology. And in the biology. The reagent is of a strength that it will dissolve that 
and show what's available in the biology. Because the biology is turning over the whole time, particularly bacteria. Some of them might only live an hour, a half an hour. Uh, fungi live longer, nematodes live longer, but there's turnover the whole time, especially if everything is working correctly. So we, we're measuring the available nutrients. We want to see all of these available nutrients. We could have thrown in vandium and yttrium and a couple of others, but um, the lab said to us, hang on a minute now. That's, you know, uh, we'll get to that later because they've now been identified as being, in fact, it can take it as understood to a greater or lesser extent uh, they may be in inf infinitesimal amounts uh, to large amounts. 54 elements are needed uh, in the system minimum. Some of them, they're already there at, at, at levels that they'll be there without doing anything. The exchange capacities then, it's essential we know the exchange capacity because that tells you the size of the holding tank and then the base uh, cation saturation ratio, that basically is the cations, the positive ions. The four major ones we're interested in are calcium, potass or, uh, magnesium, potassium and sodium. And this is a very, very contentious area. This system uh, uh, developed by William Albrecht of, of getting these calcium ratios right on the clay humus colloids, he believed set it up, and there's particular figures that suit per, uh, different soils. The ideal is around, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a good loam soil, around 68% of a loading on the, on the clay humus colloids of calcium, uh, 10 to 12% magnesium about 3, 3.5% potassium, and about 1, 1.5% sodium. And when you get that level of loading on it as, in a, as available nutrients, it, 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 it sets the, the soil structure, stroke chemistry up to facilitate. It sets an environment up to optimize uh, uh, biology, biological function. This has been questioned very severely here in Ireland and in England, because most of the work on this has been on expanding clays, clays that when they get dry, they crack, they expand, they, they have two one layers. Most of our clays in Ireland are illite clays, they're non-expanding clays. But thankfully, work coming in from Aberystwyth is showing that this has validity there. But here's the thing, even if it wasn't critical, what it's doing is getting the farmer's attention. Getting the farmer, the farmer, not the advisor, the farmer, to think about how all this works. But we believe that there is merit in this, in actually getting that uh, 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 base saturation balance as right as we can. And um, lastly then, we're going to go for exactly the same reagent that's used in a leaf analysis. A, a very strong nitric acid, hydrochloric acid reagent will be used, it's a, it's a test, standard test in the mining industry to take an ore and actually uh, dissolve the ore completely and then using mass spectrophotometry, a larger version than what Dan had shown you, to actually analyze through uh, the spectrophotometry all the elements in it. What we're doing here for this is that we know, here's the interesting thing, we know from the samples we've seen where this has been done, there's actually reasonable amounts of cobalt in the background. Um, uh, amazing amounts of phosphorus, quite a lot of sulfur in a lot of soils, and we want to see exactly if we, if, if we reach the end of a transition program, is the biology on these plots where we've set it up, and hopefully the real success of the project will be that we'll see this going on beyond the plots to, to, to the rest of the farm, is that we want to see is the... Is there, a, is there a short circuiting taking place? In other words, we now have the vigor, and I'm going to go forward, James, I know you want to cut me off, but um, I, I'm going to go forward, and I want to show you one really important slide that, 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 that'll put this all together. Just be patient with me now for a minute. Um, this is a slide, second edition, Horst Marschner's book, Mineral Nutrition of Higher Plants, and, um, <laughs> I've spent many, many a night uh, just before I went to bed on page X and uh, two, three nights later I'd be still on page X, you know. Uh, it's heavy duty stuff, but one of the things that we as farmers were learning, you need your reference material. You need your five books that have five different descriptions of boron. And in the bigger scheme of things, uh, books are, are, are never, have never been as cheap. Sometimes they may, they may look beautifully pristine and untouched or whatever, and it might be only those one or two key pages that you need to go back and ask yourself, well, what exactly did he mean by that? Because the truth is we're stumbling blind in a lot of things. But the, the cover of this, now there's a third edition out. Uh, make sure you get the third edition. 
But here, this, this is actually a glass plate along here. And uh, this is actually a, a real photograph. And this is a cow pea. Its root exits are, are at 3.5 pH, fairly acidic. And this is a maize plant with its root ed exits at 6.5. You think this, you, this guy here with legumes, legumes tend to have very acid exudates. Let me go back up to where I was. This is how you access your totals. Not just with legumes, but that you facilitate this type of exudate material that in, 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 in the, the, that, and you're not going to access it overnight, but the, what the plant really wants as an ideal, because the plant has no pituitary gland. Time is not a limiting factor on the growth of a plant. It's the environment it's in is a limiting factor on the growth of its plant. What the plant wants is whatever it needs on call. That's the ideal situation that a plant wants. Biological farming, in essence, and I think I'm going to leave it on that, is attempting to reach a point where the plant has the best of, of the possibilities to have on call what it needs to express its genetic potential. Um, but I have to leave it the last slide because, um, and you can. <laughs> this slide, this, this, actually, this actually sums it all up really. It's um, very detailed uh, as a concept, it's, um, it's big. Uh, it's put together by John Kempf, uh, a friend of Dan, Ken Dan Ketridge's. John Kempf is a bit of a genius. Um, check his stuff out online. But basically, the first thing you need to get is a level of efficiency that you, from as a consequence of, of sufficient, uh, successful photosynthesis, that you're getting the formation of complex carbohydrates, pectins, other polysaccharides. Resistance to soil-borne fungal pathogens, such as Fusarium alternia and Verticillium. The second level of development or uh, uh, accumulation of energy sufficient to do this, because it's all about energy, either the shortage of it or the excess of it and the capability of storing it or losing it, is that the transfer of sugars through roots to soil microbes release nutrients in a plant available form, which then increases resistance to insects with, single, with simple digestive systems. If you take an aphid, an aphid is a simple insect. It can't digest protein. Its ideal food is amino acids. And the surest way to make sure that you have plenty of amino acids and not enough protein is to load the plant up with nitrogen. It's just a thought. These are common sense principles that we, we can no longer ignore because it doesn't suit us. And then where the surplus energy is stored in the form of lipids, fats, oils. Lipids build up strong cell membranes for increased resistance to all airborne pathogens, parasites, disease, and, and UV radiation. This is where the plant is now developing its immune system. And it can't have a very highly functioning immune system unless it is fully mineralized. And lastly then, plant secondary metabolites, right? Plant protectants to guard against ultraviolet radiation, disease, and insect attack. And the last slide is this. Thank you very much. Thank you.